and then indeed the last session of the conference. My name's Eric Wolf, and it's my pleasure to introduce this hot topic on how rapidly can sea level rise. Um, anybody who heard the talk about IPCC or the session today knows that this is indeed a hot topic, and we really couldn't have a better speaker to cover it than Richard Alley, because this is a topic that involves glaciology and paleoclimate, and I find, as I'm sure you do, that everywhere I go in those two topics, Richard's fingerprints are all over it, having solved some of the problems that, we, that we're looking at. He's also a great speaker, which I guess is why so many of you are still here late on a Saturday evening. Um, he's, he's won many awards, including recently the Tyler Prize, um, and I think we should be grateful that the science community can reward him because, as I understand it from events earlier in the week, Manchester United are also after him, so uh, we, need, we need to keep him on board. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> without further ado, I'll give the floor to Richard to tell us how rapidly can sea level rise, and I would stay if I were you. I wouldn't be in a hurry to leave. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Eric is is staying for the Pages Steering Committee. He was over here for IPEX. He does so much service for the community, and he's such a good scientist as well. So it's, it's an honor and a privilege. At any rate, I do have the, the punchline. We don't know how rapidly sea level will rise. For those of you who are young scientists, this one is wonderful. Talk about a target to go for. I do want to thank the organizers of the meeting. I've had a ball. I've learned a lot. Um, and the funding agencies for getting us here. And thanks to you for actually staying to the, to the end here. And we'll see what we can do. We know why we care, right? I don't, I, people like to see Washington go under rather than San Francisco, but at any rate, this is, this is not a prediction, this is a scaling. This is um, most of Greenland or uh, West Antarctica and a little of East Antarctica. Um, if you put all of them in together, it becomes a big thing. And so, so yeah, you can do wash, a chunk of Washington if you would like to. So this clearly is a topic that interests people. It's clearly a topic that people would like us to give them answers on. It's worth stepping back for just a moment and remembering something. This paper by Romsdorf is useful for that, which is in a whole lot of ways now, climate science really has demonstrated skill. You know, the econ economics, right, sea level, or the, the CO2 is really sort of tracking up the way it was expected. Temperature may be a tiny bit ahead of what we expected, but temperature is basically tra tracking up the way it was projected to. Other things are happening, you know, the, the big storms, that don't, the, the big rainfalls are becoming a little more intense, the, the subtropics are expanding a little bit. In a great number of ways, climate science is demonstrably skillful. And we have to remember that. We are not playing around, we are doing things that work. The worry is, when you come to sea level, that we have sort of expected this, and what we're getting is this. And, you know, when you talk about where climate science is good, when we confront ice, we can't brag as much. And this also applies to sea ice. Sea ice in the Arctic is a little ahead of everything that was expected. And so you can say climate science is skillful, but not too much with ice. And that's worth remembering. The history of the IPCC on ice sheets is also worth remembering. In 2001, the third assessment, it was very clear that there's a big uncertainty. But the central estimate was it snows more, a little more melting in Greenland, the flow doesn't change. And so the expectation was that as sea level rises from melting of mountain glaciers and from expansion of the ocean, that the big ice sheets, if anything, would contribute a little opposing that. That the big ice sheets were our friend for the next 100 years. Now, in 2007, we, we were part of the, the, the effort that summarized that, in fact, the ice sheets are now shrinking. And, um, and they're shrinking at least in part in response to warming. And so they're sort of 100 years ahead. And so what we said was that the models to use today do not include full effects of changes in ice sheet flow. Understanding is too limited to provide a best estimate or an upper bound for sea level rise. Okay. Um, you, there are 
tables, and the tables project sea level rise, and they have numbers like 0.18 centimeter or meters or 0.59 meters, there's your range. But the numbers in those tables have as a heading excluding future rapid dynamical changes in ice flow. And so, you know, if one more person tells me that the IPCC under projected, I'm going to scream because the IPCC did not project. It projected those pieces of the sea level budget which had an assessed basis for making a number. And then it did, in US football, we use this misshapen ball, and when you can't do anything else, what you do is you drop back and punt. And that's exactly what we did, okay? We provided the quantifiable part and then we punted the rest. And um, we've got to fix this somehow, and I hope we have it fixed by the next one. Now, this is an update of the IPCC um, mass balance. This is part of the data that's pointing to something's going on that we have to understand. So 1960 is over here on your left, and today is over on your right, and up is First of all, on top is a temperature, a coastal temperature record for Greenland. And you can see that coastal temperatures have changed a little bit. And then below this are all of the published estimates of the mass balance of the Greenland ice sheet that I've been able to find. All sorts of different techniques, in and out, and weighing with, with gravity from space, and measuring surface elevation changes, and what have you. And up means putting water into the ocean causing sea level rise with balance down here. And what you'll see is it was a little warm and the ice sheet was shrinking a little and it got colder and the ice sheet quit shrinking and it got warmer and the ice sheet started shrinking again. The time scale for a big ice sheet to finish responding to a climate change may be very long. The time scale for this ice sheet to start responding to a climate change is proving to be very short and the ice sheet is contributing something in the neighborhood of 0.8 or so millimeters a year to sea level rise. So it's, it's in the game there someplace. Okay, now we just came out with a report uh, from the US um, CCSP, uh, International Team of Authors, a review process that was, was patterned after the IPCC. This is the same sign of up means raising sea level as the previous plot, but this is the paleoclimate of Greenland. So we went back and we said at different times in the past when Greenland had a size that we could assess and it had a temperature that we could assess, how were those related? And zero is sort of mean 20th century and this would be, so zero change in temperature is zero change in sea level mean 20th century. As you go to colder times of say stage two or stage six, the ice sheet is bigger so sea level is a little bit lower as a consequence. As you go to mid Holocene, as you go to 5E or into some poorly identified time which may be stage 11, Warmer conditions are associated with sea level rise because of Greenland shrinking. The uncertainties are very large in these reconstructions. They're sort of model and database to, to some extent. But, you know, if you were somebody who really likes insurance, the fact that you might get rid of Greenland for a couple of degrees would be a little bit alarming. And it's really hard to imagine that you can run more than, you know, seven degrees or so before Greenland goes. And a number of three or four might not be a terrible thing. No estimate of rate, though. Just that when it gets warmer, Greenland shrinks. Okay. Now, the surprise was Antarctica, I think. We rather expected that Antarctica was going to grow from more snowfall, that the flow would not change. You'll notice that the number of estimates of mass balance in the Antarctic is way worse. This is the same plot as two before for Greenland, but you'll notice there's basically nothing until you get past 1990. Um, but there is a, a trend of Antarctica contributing to sea level rise as well, and the uncertainties now are above zero with fairly high confidence. So you really can say with some confidence Antarctica is also contributing to sea level rise. We do have evidence of a weak warming in Antarctica globally, almost certain, as we'll discuss in a minute, that the, the mean temperature over Antarctica is not what's driving this, uh, that it's linked to some other things that we'll come back to. But Greenland and Antarctica, they're contributing to sea level rise, and this is pretty well known now. Now, the IPCC said we don't have anything that we can use as a model to project to the future because the physics are missing. That is beginning to change, 
And you heard Dave Pollard this morning with what is probably the first model that puts in key physics and actually is running into the future. And you heard, I think, the first report of those, those numbers and what they're telling us about it. Um, if he looks at the past, as he showed you, you know, one to a few millennia to make a few meters of sea level um, change is what's happened and the model sort of validates fairly well against data and the observation sub-ice shelf melt is the biggest control on that and um, it doesn't take a whole lot of warming to make a really big difference in that. There's a huge number of other efforts underway worldwide, people trying to build the next generation of models, get them, get them calibrated, get them validated and um, make them in time for the IPCC and I don't know if that will be successful or not. I know people are working on it. In the meantime, people are trying what is a sane and reasonable thing. If you can't answer the question right, get out the back of the envelope and see what you can come up with. And this is a listing of the estimates as of yesterday. Um, and I'm not going to walk you through them. Instead, what I'm going to do is show them to you on a plot. So we're going to start off looking at the left half of this plot. And these are the various sort of scalings and back of the envelope and, oh, what can we do with it that have been published. And so the IPCC, as you know, provided a range of estimates. And then they said, well, it's got to be more than that. And they actually did provide a couple of scalings, and each of those scalings was about as long as this arrow. Sort of if all the ice streams in Antarctica are thinning at two meters a year, or uh, things of that sort. And Stefan Ramsdorf provided a, um, an estimate scaling against temperature. Mark Meyer projected trends into the future with a constant rate or a constant acceleration. Tad Pfeffer and company said, what is glaciological possible? He didn't say, let's make a prediction. He said, what could happen if the ice sheet gets kicked hard? And he said, it's real hard to get past this by the year 2100, and, but this is no problem down here. And so here is a set of scalings. <coughs> And then Jim Hansen had one scaling, which actually sort of is a bit of an outlier. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and then we can add a couple of more to that. So these now don't have exactly time on them, so I just moved them out to the right. And so when, when Dave Pollard ran his model for the past, the fast rates that came up were something like this slope. So this much sea level rise at that rate. Um, we know that snowfall on the ice sheets is about seven millimeters of sea level equivalent a year. And so if you just doubled the output of all of the glaciers on the planet, you'd get a sea level rise that looked like this next one just above it. Um, and we've seen several doublings, but certainly not everything. And so that one's a useful scaling. Uh, Dave Vaughn, the British Antarctic Survey, um, did an expert elicitation. He, this is before things started really falling apart. And he went around to the experts and said, what's going to happen? And they said, not much. And he said, but what's possible? And his experts gave a 5% chance that West Antarctica by itself would be putting water into the ocean this fast, giving a sea level rise like that from West Antarctica alone by the year 2200. And then just for the scaling, there's Meltwater Pulse 1A, something similar to that, and it's almost as fast as Jim's. Um, and then we heard a couple more this morning, so we'll add those on. And Mark Marks is right over here, and it's a slightly different approach than Romsdorf's in looking at, at more paleo data to bring into that and doesn't give a huge number. And then Dave Pollard, I gave two of them. This is the, the sort of hot West Antarctic, and this is the really, really hot. He's got a flamethrower, and he is destroying all the ice shelves instantly. And that gives you, and this is just what the West Antarctic could do. And so that's really what we have on the table at this point. Um, some projections, some scalings. It's really, really hard to look at this and exclude a meter by the end of the century. It's really, really hard to look at this and get a few meters by the end of the century. And it's really hard to look at this and say that the IPCC, without their acceleration, has got it nailed. So you look at this and say, probably a little above the IPCC. And is a meter in the range? Yeah, probably. Is it five meters in the range? It's hard to imagine. Okay. So, um, and that's all we've got. Okay, so that's my answer if you want to go home. What I'd like to do, if you'll sit here and listen for a bit, is to walk through some stuff that Ian did and some other things and sort of tell you what the exciting science is going to be and maybe what's the not quite as exciting science to solve this. 
Because if you want to know people that are having real fun right now, if you, you didn't enjoy Ian's talk and see how much fun the science is right now, it's just really amazing. So let's walk through why we don't have an answer and what the cool things are that are going to be needed to get us there. Okay, again, just the, the brief physics of glaciers. Uh, let's go ignore glacier for a moment and think about anything, a mountain range, a building, what have you. If you make a pile of something, it tends to spread under its own weight. Um, and if it's strong enough, it doesn't spread, so the building is not falling down, even though it, it does have a tendency to spread. If your pile is spreading, um, if it's spreading over something smooth, it goes faster and so bumps slow it down and lubrication speeds it up. And if you hold it in, it spreads more slowly. And that's all the physics that you're really going to need for this. Um, an ice sheet is nothing more than a three kilometer thick continent-wide pile of old snow. Uh, the pressure is high underneath, it squirts to the side, and so it tends to spread under its own weight. Um, the balance is snowfall on the top, going to icebergs or else melting on the sides. Uh, it is not building up until the world rolls over. It does spread and take it down to the edge. Turn up the snow, the pile gets bigger. Turn up the spreading and you increase the calving or the melting on the edges and the pile gets smaller. And so that, that's our physics. And what we're going to say here is that the snowfall on top and the melting on top, we're going to more or less figure that the, the Atmospheric modelers are really good and they're getting really better. And what's key to this is the spreading of the pile. And so we'll walk through that. A useful scaling to keep in mind. The, the folks, Orlemans and others working on mountain glaciers have done a huge amount of work on how, as the climate changes, how the surface balance changes, snowfall and melting. And those results basically apply to an ice sheet that ends on land and balances snowfall by melting. And the real simple answer, if you change the temperature of a land-ending steady ice mass a little bit, the melting changes a lot. The ice mass comes to sit across the equilibrium line where it's most sensitive to changes in temperature, and small changes in temperature make big changes in melting. And for, for a range of mountain glaciers, it's sort of 35% per degree, maybe 25, maybe 40 or 45, but sort of 35% per degree. Uh, we do know that, that when it gets warmer that the saturation vapor pressure goes up, and that's sort of 7% per degree. And so all else equal, if you make it warmer, 35 is bigger than 7. And what that tells us is that, yeah, warming melts ice from the top. Um, because 35 and 7 are the same order magnitude, and because we know that, that you can't really do climatology from saturation vapor pressure, there certainly are cases when you warm it and it snows enough that, that you can stabilize an ice mass. But a very simple thing, if your first knee-jerk response is, my glacier is growing, it must be snowing wrong, it's snowing more, you're almost certainly wrong. The more it snows, the smaller the glacier. And that's true across a whole bunch of places and a whole bunch of times. There's a lot of glaciers today are getting more snow and they're getting smaller. Greenland is getting more snow in the middle and it's getting smaller. And not much change in Antarctica yet in snowfall. But, but basically you can find situations where warming grows the ice, but they're pretty rare. And so, so knee jerk should be, hey, when it's snowing more, I'm getting less ice. And I'm getting less ice either because of melting or because of spreading. Okay? So when we look at this, this should reply in the future. And like I say, and Ian said this this morning, we are fairly confident that the folks that do surface mass balance, snowfall and melting, are really pretty good and they're getting better. And there's a lot of good work to be done, a lot of science that needs to be done to refine that. But we don't think we're going to get surprised. We think that that's just going to get refined to give us better and better answers. For ice flow, for spreading of the pile, we think we're going to get surprised. Okay. A point I'd like to highlight, this is sort of an aside, but I think it's worth, worth highlighting. We've had at this meeting, and we, we've had people before who were at this meeting who have made the very intriguing suggestion that in fact sea level rise happened 
when the north was cold paleoclimatically, either during H1 or just after before the bowling and, um, and during other Heinrich events farther back. Okay. We've had equally well people who said no, sea level fell when the north was cold and sea level rose when the north warmed. And I'm afraid that the data just don't allow us to answer that. If somebody could answer that with confidence, pound on the table, we know that sea level does X when temperature in the north does Y, it would be very nice for us. Um, I'll tell you that if sea level rose when the north was cold, the dynamics of the Antarctic are just bizarrely more sensitive than we have possibly succeeded in imagining and we've missed a huge signal around the Antarctic that really ought to be there from that. And if it really is true that sea level rose when the north was, was cold, um, we're going to have to rewrite a lot of things and those of us who are ice dynamicists are going to have even more fun. But, um, but I'm guessing that eventually this is one that will, will end up being that sea level rose when the north warmed and sea level went down when the north got cold. But if anyone can resolve that when pound on the table, not the rising balance of evidence, but we've got this one nailed, it would be really, really nice and it would be something that would help in our understanding of ice. Okay. So, with that as a background, let's go into some of the key things that we're going to have to understand in ice sheets or things that have gotten the press, gotten interest, that, that, are, that are bouncing around out there and walk through them. So we're going to look through a whole list of these things in order, just very briefly, and show you some of the exciting things that are happening. Ian showed this picture earlier. I think probably everyone has seen this picture at some point. It is a meltwater stream on the surface of Greenland that is wandering along here and then going down a big hole and a good ways to the bottom. And as I note in the text, I personally would not want to be standing that close. Um, okay, so that would personally be the end, uh, and there's no question about that. But the question is, is it the end of the ice sheet? And as, as Ian showed you this morning, no, it probably isn't. Um, the effect of extra meltwater getting to the bed of the glacier and making it go faster is real, but it's probably order of 10%. And that seems to be because of two good physical reasons. Physical reason one, the water manages to get itself into channels rather quickly. Water that is spread out lubricates a lot of things. Water in a channel doesn't do much. And so the, the ability, when we look at the front of Greenland, the water comes out in streams. It doesn't come out in giant sheet floods. And that means the water is not hugely effective in doing anything down there. Um, and so, so that one is probably the things too is that, that Greenland is sitting on big bumpy bedrock and it's really hard to go fast when there's giant bumps in your butt. So um, Greenland can't go too far because of that. However, there is an interesting thing here that's worth pointing out and it came out of work that Byron Perzak um, did as part of his PhD with us. Um, he put he put this effect into an ice flow model and he demonstrated that if it's order of 10 percent it doesn't make a huge difference. But he, came, he said there's an interesting thing here. Greenland on the edge is thawed underneath because this meltwater is coming out so it can't be frozen, it's got to be thawed. Greenland in the middle, we know it's minus nine or so at the bottom, it's frozen to the rock. When you thaw at the bottom, the speed goes up. And maybe factor of two on bumpy bedrock, maybe not quite that much, but something like that. And if it happens to be soft mud, maybe a hundredfold. Um, and so if you thaw at the bottom, the speed goes up. The time, if you warm the surface and wait for heat to penetrate through three kilometers of ice to the base, it takes about 10,000 years. And as um, Ian showed you this morning, if you take a lake and you open a crack through the glacier, it takes about 10 minutes. And if you dump Niagara Falls to the bottom of the glacier, it's really hard to stay frozen. And so what's interesting is that if a warming world moves the lakes towards the middle, those lakes break through and they thaw a frozen bed, then this matters. And maybe factor of two in the longevity of the ice sheet, so you take 2,000 year lifetime and turn it to 1,000 or something like that. Maybe not quite that big of an effect. But um, that's probably the most interesting thing for the lifetime of the ice sheet that comes out of this. Uh, after Byron came up with that, we, we wrote a paper and said, you know, 
this is going to be volcanoes upside down. It really is going to be lakes driving cracks through the ice sheet. And I can remember writing this in a draft of an important document, and the reviewers wouldn't let me put it in. They say, we haven't observed that yet. That's a model. And then Sarah and Ian went up and, and watched it happen. And as Ian showed, fortunately, they were not in the lake when it drained. Um, and in point of fact, this is how water gets to the bottom, as the lakes drive cracks. And it's really, really, really spectacular. So here's Ian's lake. And thank you for the picture, Ian. And then here's the crack after the lake drains. And um, this really does work. If this moves inland, then Greenland, you know, you may need to dial up the speed of loss, maybe a, a twofold or so. This is sort of cute. I mean, this is one that we're not going to go very far. But as you know, there are lakes under the ice as well as on top of the ice. And the, the biologists are really excited because they want to get down there and see what bugs are living in the lakes. But usually, when the lakes show up in a, in a public release, there's some mention about, well, these subglacial lakes and their outbursts might actually change the ice flow. And what this is, it just came out in GRL from Paul Winberry and Sridhar and I, this is the sound of an outburst flood. So Paul has got a seism seismic network sitting on top of an ice stream in West Antarctica, and a lake has an outburst, and it flows under the ice to the next lake down, and as it's propagating down the ice stream, it's sort of cracking space for itself to go through, and it's making a noise like water going through pipes that isn't working right, or like harmonic tremor in volcanic settings. And so this is the sound of an outburst flood, and it's all three hertz, it's just a harmonic tremor just running down the ice stream. And so what we know, and these have been observed in other ways, changes in surface elevation by Helen Fricker and, and what have you, and so what we know is that there really are lakes underneath the, the ice sheet, and these lakes really do have outburst floods. What we also seem to know is they're not doing much to the ice flow. And so, um, you know, the, the places where they've been observed, you just don't see the flow change very much because the water sort of gets where it's going in a hurry. It's just a quick drip. It doesn't say spread out. And in fact, Ian and I and Mark Fonestock suggested that if anything, Maybe having these floods makes the ice sheet a little more stable or a little fl slower flowing because um, you're taking the lubrication potential and rather than spreading it out and getting the most out of it, you're putting them in little drips that are running down the ice, big drips that are running down the ice stream. And so um, I think subglacial lakes are going to be interesting geomorphically, but they probably are not doing much to the ice dynamics. Okay, so we're trying to kill things off here, cool things. This, I'm going to kill one more, and then we'll get on to things that are worrisome. If you followed the press, you know that, that Meredith Nettles and Victor Tsai and, and others have been, uh, they did some really clever things. They, they went into the, the world seismic network, and they looked for things that were a little slower than what the auto pickers had been finding. They, they had this huge network, and they collect all these data, and, and no human can look at all of it. And, and so they set up things that look for you. And so they went in and looked for things that are a little slower. And what they found were giant rumbling earthquakes coming off of Greenland. And there were more of them with time. As it warmed up and the ice went faster, the earthquakes were rumbling louder. And so the press got a hold of this. And you can hear Greenland falling into the ocean and flooding the coast. And the disaster is coming and so on. And Ian Jock and said, you know something? Every time a big iceberg falls off the front of one of these ice streams, we get an earthquake. And he said, I'll bet those are just the icebergs. And Mark Fauna said, that's what it is. It's the icebergs rolling over. And so now they've gone in. And in fact, at least most of these big glacial earthquakes are the icebergs rolling over. And so they aren't actually the sound of Greenland falling in the ocean, except that it does make icebergs. They are. I, swiped some pictures anyway because they're just so incredibly cool. So these are some pictures that um, Martin Trufer took working with Mark and with Ian. And um, we're going to go through 90 seconds. We are, we are 10K away from an iceberg calving event. And we're looking at something that's about two kilometers wide. So this, this picture is about two kilometers across. The little red bar right here is 100 meters high. Okay, about 100. The ice is flowing towards you like this, it breaks off at, at the red bar. And the stuff in the foreground here is actually just broken up ice on deep water. 
and their seals pump their heads up through. And when I get to the end of this, there'll be a seal, so you'll know you've gotten to the end. But what I want you to notice is if this bar is about 100 meters high, this is the iceberg rolling over. Okay, so this bar is 100, this is bigger than 100. And I'm just going to run through the pictures here. And if, just watch that iceberg. It's really sort of, this is why you can hear this clear off on other continents, you know. <laughs> and there's a seal. But, um, <laughs> so, so these icebergs, these, these big earthquakes are out there, but they don't seem to be the sound of Greenland falling in the ocean. I think we're going to learn a lot from these earthquakes. I think we need to, to listen to them. But, but, so now we've just killed off three things. The lakes are not the doom of the, uh, the lakes from above are not the doom, maybe factor two. The lakes from below don't seem to be the doom. The, ice, the giant earthquakes don't seem to be the doom of the ice sheet. So how are we going to kill the ice sheet if it dies? Okay. Probably the easiest way to make the ice go really fast is to thaw it in a place that it's stuck to something slippery but frozen. So if you freeze ice to, to till, and then you thaw the till, uh, mud, it, the ice goes really fast. And that still is far and away the best explanation we have for Heinrich events. How is it possible that you have these giant armadas of icebergs carrying all this debris out into the North Atlantic? Far and away the best story is that you've got a totally lubricated ice stream in Hudson Strait that freezes. And that means it goes really slow, and when it thaws, it goes really fast. And so if you can find anywhere that's frozen on potentially soft bed, that's what's scary. Okay. We don't have a map of potentially soft beds at this point. Uh, we're getting fairly good at knowing where it's frozen, although it's not perfect yet. Um, but uh, that's something that we probably need to look for before we're done here. Um, if you're frozen, you know, 10,000 years for heat from the top to get to the bottom, unless you get surface melt water, in which is 10 minutes, or unless it's frozen right at the edge, and you thought you kick something out and it flows a little faster and it deforms and it makes heat and it goes faster. So this is a challenge for us and for the exploration geophysicists to sort of figure out where it's frozen, where it's thawed, and where there's, where there's soft sediment under the frozen things. Um, is there a possibility of a Heinrich event in our future? Probably not, but not certain. And that's one that we're going to have to keep an eye out, whether there could be one somewhere. Okay. So that would be a bad thing to do with an ice sheet. Um, the next thing that people usually talk about, about bad things to do to ice sheets, is to raise sea level really fast. Um, because if you float the edges, then the ice goes faster and that'll make a difference. Okay. This is something we've been working on recently, and sea level is looking less potent than we used to think. You saw from Dave Pollard's talk that when he modeled the things that kick West Antarctica, sea level matters a little bit and warmer water matters a lot. And that seems to be the right answer. And if you've been teaching people that, in fact, the Laurentide Ice Sheet controlled the Antarctic through sea level, it's possible that's still correct, but be very careful because it's looking like sea level may not be nearly as potent as we once thought it was. And that seems to be in part because of sedimentation. Uh, if you pause the grounding line for a little while, it makes a pile, and the pile gives you friction. And now you need a lot of sea level rise to float you off of the pile. And in fact, where we've been able to measure, which is reasonably restricted yet, the, the flotation point, the grounding line of the Antarctic is sitting on geologic features or its own sedimentary piles. It's actually stabilized a little bit against motion. And I'm going to show you um, a model here. This is, this is um, work by Dave Pollard that we had in a, um, in a paper in science a couple of years ago. And what I want you to do first is watch the top panel. And so this is a flat bed with an ice stream flowing out to sea, which is this blue blob out here with air on top. The ice is flowing from left to right. Um, the grounding line can't go past the left edge. We, he's just holding it. He won't let it go past there. And what he's going to do is raise sea level. And initially, higher sea level is just pushing back on the ice, and it slows down and thickens. And then it will start to float the ice. And when it does, you'll notice the grounding line migrate back. 
So just watch the top panel first, and we'll go through a, a model simulation with an earlier version of Dave's model, and sea level is rising, and the ice is thickening, and ignore the bottom one, and here comes the grounding line, and it just migrates back. And so that's a nice, beautiful, sort of linear response. That would be the thing that, if the northern hemisphere ice sheets were controlling Antarctica, that's what you'd expect to see. Now what I want you to do is watch the bottom panel. Okay, so this is the same simulation, except now there's a bump. And what you're going to see is that the bump affects things, and the grounding line will actually leap to the bump, and then it hangs onto the bump for dear life until it jumps farther upstream. And so here we go, and just watch the bottom panel. Sea level rises, and at some point it begins to float the edge of the ice sheet. The grounding line runs to the bump, and now it's just hanging onto that bump for dear life. It's, it's stabilized. Modern grounding lines look like they're stabilized. And then boom, when you kick it off that grounding line, off the bump, it goes in a hurry. Okay, so now what we're going to do is run through that one more time. Watch the bottom one, and what you're going to say is that the modern ice sheet, the grounding line is here. It's already retreated back about this far. It's built these bumps and it's building them up. It's sedimenting. So it's really trying to stay there. But if you kick it too hard, what happens? Bang, it runs away. And you get a big response. And so what we can sort of summarize for that, if there were no geology, if there were no topography, if there were no sedimentation, the um, northern hemisphere would have a very easy time of controlling Antarctica because it would, um, it would just retreat like this as sea level rose. But in fact, because there's sedimentation, because there's geology and topography, you tend to get the grounding line stuck somewhere, and you have to kick it pretty hard to get it off. And that's a lot of meters of sea level rise. And a lot of meters of sea level rise takes a long time. And what I'm going to show you is that it almost always will get kicked by something else before that much sea level rise happens. And so the real big thing is, is, is coming up next. So the real big thing to do to Antarctica especially is to melt its ice shelves. From above, from below, it doesn't care too much. It's just melt the ice shelves. Again, for a reminder, when the ice flows down to the coast, it, it typically, as long as it's sort of sub-freezing, it doesn't have a huge amount of meltwater, when it gets to the coast, it flows over the ocean as an ice shelf. There's ocean water beneath it at the melting point. It's low and warm on top. It will run aground on spots, or it will have friction on the sides. This provides friction that holds the, the central ice back in the same way that a flying buttress holds back the Gothic cathedral. You can get this really easily with warming down here. Okay. This is the classic one. Ian showed this very briefly. We're down in the Antarctic Peninsula, so we're right down here, and we're looking at this green thing. Um, the green thing is here. Um, this is the Antarctic Peninsula itself. The mountain range uh, there, black out here, is ocean water. These are big icebergs sitting in the ocean water. Your scale bar is 20K over here, and this funny on here is meltwater sitting in the crevasses. And you saw when you make a lake, when you fill up the crack in Greenland, it breaks through. Well, if you fill up the crack in Antarctica, it can break through too. And so what we're going to do is the, the large warming down here has made a difference. This picture is taken January 31st, 2002. So let me make the labels go away, and then over the next five weeks, we make the ice shelf go away. And you know, it's, it's still, as many times as you've seen this, it's still sort of spectacular. This blue slushy that's left behind is, you'd run your kayak through that. It's just a little broken up stuff. Now that lost the friction up here, it lost the friction down in here, and this one is going about eight times faster than it had been because that friction is not holding it back. And so this is probably, it was meltwater on top plus a little warmer water underneath. This thing apparently had been there for 10,000 years from when it formed as the ice age shrank, the, the, the end of the ice age shrank the ice sheet until, until it fell apart there. Now that can't raise sea level much because there isn't much ice behind it, but as Dave Pollard showed this morning, there's a lot of ice behind these other ice shelves. And if you put warm water under them, that might do something. Now, this is the picture of the Larsen B before it collapsed, and you can see the meltwater in the cracks right there, and that's busily wedging the cracks open and ready to fall apart. Interestingly, Greenland doesn't have this because it breaks through so far inland that you have plumbing, and when the ice flow gets to the coast, the ice is plumbed, and you can't fill the cracks because it's going down the holes. 
Um, and in fact, it's possible to have an ice shelf in, in Greenland at a temperature which is warmer than what would kill one in Antarctica. And there's a very interesting hysteresis here. First warming fills the cracks, breaks them through. More warming moves that inland, and then you could actually maybe regrow an ice shelf. And Byron perzak has been working on this, but there's some interesting things going on there. You can kill the ice shelf from above, fill the cracks, it falls apart. You can kill the ice shelf from below. This is simply a, a scaling. This is the ocean temperature beneath the ice shelf uh, relative to freezing, and this is the, the estimated melt rate beneath the ice shelf. And what you'll notice is this is one Celsius above freezing, and that's 10 meters per year. And, and you know, you turn up the ocean temperature by a degree, and most ice shelves are not, don't, that they'd go away. They'd be in big trouble fairly quickly. And so you can attack them from above, you can attack them from below very easily. I showed you an eightfold speed up when one ice shelf went away. Dave Pollard showed you in his model that as the ice shelves go away, the speed up happens. Do we know that that's true in the real world? Well, right down here, we're at the head of the Ross ice shelf, and we're on an ice stream, and Sridhar Krishnan has got uh, some GPS out. And the, um, this is actually the daily tide in the motion of the ice stream where it hits the Ross ice shelf. And the change in speed is a factor of two. So the one meter tide, a little more water pushing back, cuts the speed in half. And that a little less put, that's a guy. And, that, and then if you go 80 kilometers inland, it's, you still see it very clearly. And so, yes. If you were to take away the resistance of the big ice shelves, the flow behind it would notice immediately, directly, and in a great deal. And, and the data that we have are completely consistent with what Dave Ballard was showing you in his models. This really is, is the big deal. Um, just a reminder, th this is not actually under an ice stream, of course, but just a reminder that, that the ice goes really fast where it has mud underneath it, till, soft sediment, and our understanding of the physics of soft sediment deformation is not quite as good as it should be. Um, it's fairly clear that sometimes it's a plastic, sometimes it's viscous, sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's weak. There's a lot of science on this, but um, but there's a little work to be done in terms of once you take the load off the end and the thing deforms a little faster, what exactly will it do is going to depend on our knowledge of soil mechanics. And that's a little shaky at some times. Okay. One more point and then we'll, we'll synopsize and get out of here. Um, to the best of my knowledge, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but to the best of my knowledge, no one yet has a, an ice flow model that physically is deciding where it ends. Um, does the ice actually go across the ocean and run aground on the high spot, or do the icebergs break off first? To do that, you have to know the rules for breaking off of icebergs, and we don't know those rules. And so usually what people do is they say, well, my ice sheet ends here. Um, or they say, well, my ice sheet ends here because that's where it sits. Um, Dave is doing some interesting things with his. But in a general rule, we don't really know when the icebergs break off and so whether the thing really will be able to reach out, get the buttressing from here, and support itself. And we had one in, in science last year where we noticed something. We said, you know, the faster the ice is stretching, this is the stretching rate down here, the faster it's sort of opening the cracks, the faster the icebergs break off. And so this is a rule that says faster stretching gives faster calving, and this is a data set across sort of the all of the icebergs that we could find. Ian Jockin made a lot of these wonderful data, and, um, and you know, this sort of works. I will be absolutely flabbergasted if this is the last word in this. I can't imagine that it could be this simple, but if this is part of the answer, it's really concern because it's an unconditionally unstable calving law. It says when the glacier backs off of this bump, it has to go to the next bump before it can stop. So if this physics happens to be right, maybe things are even worse than we thought. And that's something that worries me a good bit here. So, so what can we say? Let's, let's synopsize and get out here. If you want to do this right, um, we do have simple models in, in the you know, 1D sorts of things, simplified things that are getting the 
physics right. Um, we've got Dave Pollard's model, which is which is really a step forward here. Um, but you know, especially the simplified models up here, there's some some tuning issues of things that are not terribly known physically. Um, we're never going to get under the ice and measure the till properties of the entire Antarctic ice sheet. So there's a huge data assimilation project. If we actually build the right models, we're still going to have a huge data assimilation project ahead of us to, to do this. I think pretty much every major modeling group and a lot of minor modeling groups in the world have said, this is important, we should do it. And I think every major modeling group is doing this at a time when the economy sucks. And they're going after it with a person or two, or a postdoc, or something like that. And um, it's you know sort of the research commitment. They're doing the best they can, but the research commitment that's going into this is really minuscule compared to the problem that's out there. That's an opinion, but um, I think it's a right one for what it's worth. And so, so let, let me summarize then. If it gets warmer, it melts ice. In general, the more it snows, the less ice you have. Um, and if you're still sort of looking for warming, growing your ice sheets, be very, very careful. That's not very likely. Um, we don't have any good evidence. You turn up temperature and it snows more and that saves you. And a whole lot of evidence that that's, that's wrong. Um, yeah, maybe my ice sheet controlled your ice sheet or your ice sheet controlled my ice sheet by floating it off the bed, but that's a pretty slow forcing in a system that stabilizes itself by sedimentation. And most of what, where we can see grounding lines, they're fairly stabilized against that. What really gets to ice sheets is either you make it warm on top and they melt, or you make it warm around the edge and they lose their ice shelves and the ice shelves are holding the sheet back and that unplugs it and lets it go in a hurry. And until we solve that one, all the others are sort of fine tuning knobs that are sitting behind it. Um, Dave turned on his flamethrower and he's still, you know, the time scale for dumping an ice sheet is a century to set centuries, something like that. Um, and so I, it doesn't look like we can kill off an ice sheet in, in a century. But we might commit to killing off an ice sheet in the century. You know, you might get to the point that it's really, really hard to get your ice sheet back, and that could happen within not that many decades. We really don't know, because we don't have reliable projections. We don't have worst-case scenarios. Uh, how fast can sea level rise in our near future? I, you, you looked at the back of the envelope. It's really hard to look at that and say we can't have a meter per, year, per century. Um, but it's pretty hard to get a whole bunch of meters per century in our near future. And, and I'll tell you, like I say, I think the modeling groups are doing wonderful work and they're trying really hard and the community is rallying around this. But I personally think if we had attacked ocean atmosphere modeling with the same financial vigor that we've attacked ice sheet modeling, that we'd still be on the second assessment report. We'd have never gotten to the third. I, I just don't see that, that this commitment is commensurate with what's going on. But that's strictly an opinion on my point. And I'm not looking for the money. I want to give it to the modelers. But um, at any rate, I want to thank you for coming. Thank you for saying. If you want something really fun to do, we're having a ball right now. The paleo of sea level, the future of sea level, the ice sheets. There is a lot of work to do here, and it's really exciting, and thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was fantastic. We can go on as long as we like, I believe, so let's have some questions. Everybody's stunned or terrified. <laughs> Ready for a beer. <laughs> mentioned that the pinning points or something have a buttressing effect. Is there also some, buttress, some effect of the ice hanging onto the ice behind it or around it that keeps it together? I'm the, talking about the ice extending out into the ocean. Th there's a little bit, and Ian was pointing at this, that right, it, the inland ice sitting on bumpy rock is primarily supported by friction right beneath it. But when you get to a 
steep margin, like the calving front of a tidewater glacier that's not floating, that steep margin is not supported. So it reaches a little ways behind it and, and pulls. Essentially, the front wants to fall off. You know, If you build a, a pile of loose things and let go, it, the, the front falls off. And so these calving fronts, if they're not floating, where Jakobshavn is right now, the front still wants to fall off because it's not supported. And that, in turn, does propagate some distance behind it. So wherever you've got a steep margin, it's reaching a little ways behind it. And, and these basically, you're going to have to get um, Greenland's outlet glaciers out of the ocean and then let the margin round off before they really quit reaching what's behind it. That fair, Ian? OK. There's one over there. Sorry, make you run away. <laughs> after the coffee breaks, so I could have used the running. <laughs> what, was, what was different or special about Meltwater Pulse 1A that made, it, that made the rate of sea level rise so much higher than any of the future predictions that you showed? Right. I would love to answer that. And I, is Peter still here? He probably is. Um, I, my personal belief is that it was just a really big warming when there was still a fair chunk of ice around. And that so before that, if you, I'm, I'm driving it mostly from the north, and before that the temperature rose slowly and the ice responds slowly. And at Meltwater Pulse 1A, you pop out of H1 out of the mystery interval and you nail a whole lot of extensive ice. It's pretty low and pretty well lubricated. Um, and so it's got a large area, and you just crank the temperature up a very few degrees on that, and that would generate that kind of meltwater flux. Um, in Peter Clark and Terry Mitrovica's modeling, they preferred, you'll recall, a southern source for the meltwater pulse, or for a lot of it, but they included a meltwater coming from everywhere solution as being consistent with the data. And so my personal belief is you've still got some calving, you've still, you've got, the southern margin of the Laurentide it cannot possibly be all of it. Peter showed that completely unequivocally. But the Laurentide at H2 comes down as this big, thick, lumpy thing. And then later it comes down sort of low. And if you've got a low one, a little bit of warming gives you a big area of ablation. And so my gut feeling is that we'll find that it's mostly just warming plus a little bit of the marine margins. But Peter's hypothesis, which is that it comes, a chunk of it comes out of our Antarctica and a little bit before the bowling onset, if that's true, that just knocks us on our, on our rear ends and we got to stand up and redo a lot of things. And I don't know, is Peter here? Okay, he can yell about that later. <laughs> I hope I haven't done, done injustice to him on it. And the, the work he did and the work they've been pushing on using the, the sea level fingerprint as finding out um, where the source of the water was, it's really pushing the data set. But if that can be made to work even better, you know, right now he couldn't resolve uh, meltwater from everywhere from meltwater from Antarctica. But um, if that could be resolved a little better, it would answer it. Not, not to put you on the spot, but what's it going to take to get the right level of resources to attack this problem? Yeah, that, I mean, I think that we sort of know what the level of resources would be, which is serious modeling groups at a few of the places that would allow the academic modelers to to do the, you know, the development, to this is what works and this is what doesn't work, um, and then to feed into the big modeling groups who are coupling it into the, the couple ocean atmosphere systems. Right now, all the big global models cannot possibly do melting of Antarctica because they're not, they stop their ocean model before they get to the ice that it's going to melt. Uh, and the, the AR4 has a really disturbing slide showing the, the lack of agreement of Antarctic sea ice simulated by the models. And, um, and that sea ice is really important in the temperature of the ocean water that goes under the shelves. So, so it's going to take getting the Antarctic Ocean right, the Southern Ocean right, and it's going to take 
coupling these things in, and then it's going to take this big data assimilation effort because they really are going to have to follow the sort of work that Ian Jockin has been doing, Doug McHale have been doing on finding out how the ice flows and inferring the bed based on the surface, our knowledge of physics, and the point geophysical measurements where they're possible. Um, generating that, you know, how do you get, you know, my understanding is that actually the UK, the, the, the Hadley Center just about lost their climate money the last budget round. And, you know, and, and it, it seems to be held together, but, you know, in a, in a world where they're trying to take away the, uh, a huge, wonderful, exciting modeling center that's doing so much good work, in a world where that's trying to disappear, how do you make it grow? And, um, I don't know. Eric? <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't think the Hadley Centre's lost all its money, but <laughs> maybe the money it could have used for ice sheet models. So. More. One there. Sorry, it's really hard to see you at the back, so you have to wave hard. Um, so I don't know very much about uh, ice sheets at all, so maybe this is a naive question, but if the warming that comes along with increased snowfall means that you lose ice instead of gaining ice, and you need snow to make ice in the first place, how did you get all of these ice sheets in the first place if increasing snowfall doesn't increase ice? Yeah, no, you just drop temperature, you drop melting faster than you drop snowfall. Um, it's the easiest way to do it. They certainly, you know, what, 10 years ago, the glaciers in Norway were growing a little bit because North Atlantic Oscillation was, was plus and it was pumping more, more snow in there, and so a little bit of warming had led to growth. It is possible to have, to just turn up snow like crazy and make a glacier, but that's, I think it's very rare that that is the answer. Normally, you simply turn down melting more than you turn down snowfall. And so the lines, so, so you know, you're sitting here and what, what do you have? You have something that sort of goes from hot to cold over here and you say how much is snowfall and snowfall is this curve and melting is this curve. So here's melt and um, so what happens is as you go from hot to cold, you're dropping your, your snowfall like this, but the, the melting simply drops more and it falls below it and then you can grow the ice. So what we find, you know, there's lots of hypotheses out there that, you know, the secret to growing the ice sheets was to open the Arctic Ocean so it got really warm and it snowed like crazy. But what do we find? The ice grows after it starts to cool. What do we find as soon as it warms, the ice starts melting? What do we find? Glaciers are, are thermometers and their thermometers in smaller is warmer, not bigger is warmer. Sorry, Leah, there's one on the other side. <laughs> the insurance industry has an interest in this. Have you talked to them about this? Because there was a flurry of uh, information that came out this week on the Internet about the research they're doing, and it seems like they are looking at economic risk and you're dealing with the science. How does this group marry that? Yeah, um, I personally have not. There are certainly people working through the IPCC and elsewhere who have a good bit and you're certainly right. They are very, very um, concerned about this particular one and the numbers that come out of here probably do feed fairly directly into insurance rates for people. And um, my suspicion is that the insurance companies, uh, they're fairly cautious about the future for obvious reasons. And my suspicion is that they actually read the column in the IPCC report where it said excluding future rapid dynamical changes in ice flow and that they actually took that to heart. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't, does anyone have any insight? Has been talking to Munich Re? Um, but, um, but you're certainly right. And so um, this one, what we do here, we're not just playing with ourselves. This really, really does matter. And it's going to matter ultimately to decisions about do you build walls or do you build buildings down there next to the coast or do you move back? Just, just an answer what's concerning Swiss Re and Munich Re because we have students, former students working there. 
they're investing amounts like uh, one million dollar per three years in, in, into this business. But they're, they're investing money, they're having groups with climatologists and they're investing money and, and, and they're, they're, they're really being afraid if, you, if you're talking with the responsible persons and I think uh, if, if in, in, in the future they could even invest more money into research because they're just taking into account what could happen and but but then it's it's clear the prices for for insurance will also rise yes yes they're they're smart people and they're very concerned about this I actually have one question that should concern this audience which is uh, I mean the efforts going into looking at the modern processes and into modeling what do you think would be the best things that we as paleo scientists could do to constrain this problem? Because ice sheets are moving on paleo timescales, so we ought to be able to do more. But yeah, yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd really love to see um, the ability to do this, this sea level fingerprinting, and to find out which ice sheets were contributing when. I'd really love to know how rapidly the ice grew and shrank in stage three, and whether it was really on the northern, uh, northern schedule or the southern schedule. Um, we're going to have to, you know, can we really get a, an estimate of just how much warming took out and when did Greenland go? You know, there's this, this wonderful question that, that what, at DI3, we've probably seen it, there's wonderful work out of the Danish group that, um, that probably sort of stage 11 plus or minus about three marine isotope stages or four. Um, there was a boreal forest at Die 3 in South Greenland. And the far field sediment core, you know, the North Atlantic sediment cores don't make stage 11 much warmer than stage five, if at all. And so, and, and it's hard to imagine having a boreal forest at, at um, Die three after isostatic response while having much ice anywhere else on Greenland. And there's this, this unpublished result in one abstract. We, we, at GIS2, we, we drilled into the rock in a joint grip GIS2 GIS project. And that was analyzed for the, the um, cosmogenic isotopes. And there's an abstract from AGU from 1995 that says that Greenland went away for a few thousand years about 500,000 years ago. Um, because if you've got cosmic rays hitting the rock at, at GISP-2, there is not much ice left. Um, but it was never published because there were just little inconsistencies in the data. But the sketch is that, that Greenland went away at a time when 5E sort of temperatures obtained in the North Atlantic around it. And nailing that down, uh, is it three degrees, is it four degrees, it's five degrees, Betty Otto Bleasner led the effort on, on this for the 5E and the great shrinkage uh, with the very few degrees there, it was three or four around it. Um, and then, then the feedback from the ice shrinking gets you a little more, but sort of, if you take out the feedback from the ice shrinking, it was three or four. And that probably was a few meters of sea level from Greenland. So nailing, nailing the history of that, and then, you know, Antarctica, you know, you've done more in Antarctica than anyone you can think of, but my goodness, how many questions can you ask about the extent of the ice sheet and what it was doing and the retreat history and how fast it went and were there any jumps and are the, the, um, the sort of sediment piles synchronous or, or asynchronous and is that telling us about sediment dynamics or about forcing from the far field? And We can't answer any of those questions. And, and it's and like I say, I can say it to him because he's done more than anybody. But <laughs> so so this one, this is just a ripe field. You'd think it, it had been played out, but you actually go back and look at the dating of the southern margin of Laurentide ice sheet, which we've had radiocarbon ages on for forever, and it's still not very secure. It's one log here and a, and a you know a limiting date and a bog there, and yeah. <laughs> Continuing with the long time kind of perspective, do you have thoughts on the kind of examination that David Archer and perhaps others have been doing into the future that we could, um, whether quickly or slowly, melt off enough of the large ice caps to actually skip an interglacial uh, with the associated temperature rise that that would 
be associated with? Yeah, I think that I was... Mean, I mean, sk excuse me, skip, skip a glacial. A glacial. Yeah, that, that we, we may have already committed to not having the next ice age, and, and we certainly can, according to all the run out. So it's this age-old one, and you all know this, but you know, you dump the CO2 in the air, and immediately almost half of it goes in the ocean. And then the rest of it goes a lot slower because now you got to mix it into the deep ocean and rather than a few years now you're out to a whole bunch of decades and then you got to dissolve the shells in the seafloor and that depends on the bioturbation rate of the seafloor to bring up shells so you can dissolve them to, nu to neutralize the CO2 and now you're thousands of years and then you got to weather rocks and, and now you're out to you know, 100,000 year time scale. And so we put, you know, 1,000 ppm V in the atmosphere and we're above glaciation threshold probably through when the next ice age ought to be. So we, we can head the next one off. We may not have done so quite yet, but we're, we might have and we got to be pretty close to it. So. Um, I, I've actually heard moderately glib people say we should save the fossil fuels so we can burn them when we need them to head off the next ice age out there at 20 or 40,000 years. Um, I think that we actually know enough about chlorofluorocarbons that, that, that we can make things that are really nastier greenhouse gases and CO2. <laughs> yeah. I can't see anyone waving their hand around. So on, on that geoengineering note, <laughs> perhaps we should stop and thank Richard again and then pass over to Betty. Oh, he left his computer so I can do some drawing. <laughs>